welcome to the next lesson, The Cost of Rest, lesson number four. Brian, and welcome to our lesson. And welcome to viewers and pray for us, please. Thank you, Neil. Welcome to all of viewers. And um, what a beautiful study we have. And uh, we pray that God will bless you richly. And let's ask for the Holy Spirit now. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to study, to be able to hear from you how we can be overcomers. No matter how far we may have fallen, your desire is to rescue us, to restore us, to renew our minds, and to prepare us for eternity with you. What a wonderful God you are. Bless each one now and Renee and myself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much. So our story today is based upon the life of David and what the cost of rest or idleness actually cost him in the end of the day. And our theme text comes from Psalm 51 verse 10. It says, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So each day's lesson or part of this lesson will clearly explain what this lesson is about. So I'm not going to give an overview of that, which we're going to talk about in any case. So what we're starting with is on Sunday, worn and weary. Mm. And this is where, I mean, if you, if you think of David's history, here's a man that had the guts and the faith to conquer a lion and a bear you know, I believe most people, when that line would have come and taken the lambs, would have said, you know what, enjoy your lunch. I've got another 99. Um, I'm not taking that risk. But not David. He goes and he kills the lion. He kills the bear. When he hears Goliath, he says, you know, this guy's defying the God of Israel. And mm -hmm. he went up and he slayed Goliath. And then the wars that he won under the leadership of Saul, and, you know, Saul obviously got jealous of him, etc. And we all know what happened there. And so this is a man of faith, a friend of God, a, a man that is close to the heart of God. And here, idleness leads to a major, major problem. I, you know, still when I read it, I'm just like, Lord, if this can happen to David, you know, such a man after God's heart, then surely I must pray, Lord, continually keep me safe until the coming of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Brian? Here, David is walking on the roof. He sees Bathsheba. He takes matters into his own hand. You know, I mean, this was a calculated plan. This thing was worked out. I'm going to call her over. I've got plans, etc. Meaning he had ample time to change his mind or to follow the will of God. Yet he went forth with this. First part of the story. I want your comments. And then secondly, he then has a plan. He makes Uriah drunk so that he can go and sleep with his wife acting as if it would be his child then. And then he saw he couldn't get that right. And he actually then puts him in front of the army at the most difficult time and people retreat and he dies. So he commits murder. Brian, I almost want to say, let's not talk about the sad story, but we need to talk about it. And in, in the context of the cost of rest, how do you understand Sunday's part of the lesson? So, Renier, I, I imagine the scene here uh, when um, I traveled to Israel. Um, they've excavated and they are still carrying on with the excavations till today. The very palace where they believe David's um, citadel was. <coughs> and uh, Dr. Francois Duplessis, and uh, it was interesting to see the, the topology. Uh, of the area because it's on the um, east to western side of Jerusalem and it's got a slope. Mm. Um, and you can see from where he was because he's closer to the top. And of course, Uriah the Hittite would have bought a place. I mean, he must have been quite wealthy uh, to have bought a place close to the king's palace. Mm. Um, but uh, clearly... David would have had an advantage point if he was on the roof looking down. And it appears then, um, you know, Bathsheba was bathing um, also on her rooftop, maybe. Uh, that's probably what they used to do. And at this point in time, uh, David sees this beautiful woman. The Bible says she was very beautiful. And um, instead of reacting as Joseph did, 
centuries before him, you know, Joseph fled from the scene. Mm. Uh, and, and his was even worse because <laughs> Mrs. Potiphar grabbed him, you know, and she was yes. close by. <laughs> mm. And uh, you can imagine how she was dressed as well. Uh, but, but he fled the scene. Now, 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 David should have walked away. You know, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. Um, but anyhow, he, he fed or feasted his eyes on Bathsheba. And then, of course, the devil, seeing his attention and focus on this lady, uh, made some really, really subtle suggestions. Of course, he's the king. Uh, at this time, David uh, is very prosper, prosperous. God has given him victory upon victory. Uh, most of the tribes are settled. I mean, the Ammonites, which were cousins to the, the Israelites um, uh, from one of Lot's daughters, I mean, they were posing problems. But it, it seemed like uh, Joab had the case, you know, uh, under control. Um, so David feels, you know, you'll stay at home. Um, in this time of ease, self-sufficiency, self-dependency, and probably pride, uh, because he's supposed to be out there with his men, uh, the devil got hold of him. So what, what, what happened? We know the story, you know. Uh, he sent for her next thing, you know. He has committed adultery. And uh, I'm sure she probably remonstrated because, you know, we, we see in our study later on, it says um, um, when Nathan came, you know, Ellen White commenting on that said that he had sinned against Uriah and Bathsheba. Mm. So, so um, I'd like to believe that he, you know, used his influence as the king mm. to press his demands upon her. But um, yeah, like you say, you know, the Bible points out, he then tries to cover up after she sends a message. Listen, I'm a child. This is your, you know, doing here, David. Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, but we see, he tries to cover. So one sin leads to another. Um, first, you know, he tries to, of course, make him drunk. Uh, that was a real terrible thing to do. So deception, deception, deception. And when it couldn't work out, because Uriah was a principled guy, he was a stellar kind of human being. Now, how can I go and, mm. you know, enjoy time with my wife? How can I go and eat and uh, enjoy when my fellow soldiers are on the field and they are fighting for the kingdom. And so he was a much more, in this case here, you know, principal man than David was. Mm. And of course, you know, Ellen White says when, when David was young and depended upon God in his earlier years, then it was that he had a heart after, um, a mind after God's own heart. But of course, at this point here, his mind has been influenced by the devil. And then of course, the next thing is, he actually sends Uriah after he sees he won't go to his house so that mm. he could, you know, be, uh, well, you know, it's your child now. You spend time with your wife, you know, so it's obviously your child. When he sees this doesn't work, he sends him back to Joab with the, his own death warrant in his hand. Mm. And of course, Joab, being the kind of person he was, next thing Uriah is put on the front line where he knows there's valiant men that he's fighting against and not only Uriah, but some of uh, the other, you know, soldiers were killed as a result mm. of this plot by David the king. And yeah, sad, sad, sad story. Yeah, I think what we need to understand from this, uh, you know, as Brian has said it so well and summing up this whole, whole experience, is that we can so easily fall into this trap when we find ourselves idle and not where we're supposed to be. David was supposed to be with his men at war, mm -hmm. not idle at home. And you, today, I mean, if you have this thing, you can easily just scroll through YouTube innocently going through it. And then you see, let's say something you're not supposed to see just in the front picture of the video or online or, you know, it's, it's everywhere. And David's choice in the moment when he saw it was to keep on looking and That's to right. desire. The looks went over into desire, went into passions. And God is saying, you know, in that moment, when you have seen, rather turn away, you know, like as Joseph did. And we are faced with these same things. And I, I know of many people in our church, not in our congregation, but in the global church, that is addicted to pornography is addicted mm. to women, etc., or has committed adultery because they have seen and then they desired. Instead of seeing, 
for by accident or whatever, and then rejecting and giving your heart to God in the moment and asking him victory over my passions and over my appetite or whatever it is that is making me or that would lead to my fall in that moment. So yeah, David unfortunately makes this decision, but then he gets a wake up call. This is yeah. Monday part of Monday's part of the lesson. Nathan, the prophet comes to him and tells him a story of a rich man that doesn't take off his own flock, but takes off a poor man's flock. Mm. And David says, you know, that man, tell me where he is. <laughs> he needs to be killed, you know, imprisoned or whatever the punishment is, you know, very stern and harsh at that moment as to this is what needs to happen. This, how can you take a poor man's flock when you have your own and you just leave that there? And then obviously Nathan tells him, well, you are that man. That's an interesting way of how Nathan approached David when he said, you are that man. Brian, do you think Nathan would have been like, you know, finger in the face, you are that man. You know, you have committed the sin. You are a terrible person. Or how do you think Nathan, this whole story played out? So, so I mean, uh, the parable that he used was so illustrative of the plight of this person who had lost their only sheep. And of course, it awakened in David, you know, indignation and a response as, you know, how dare that person do that? I mean, Jesus did that all the time with the scribe and the Pharisees. You know, he told them these parables, you know, uh, about a soul went out to sow and this had happened. And um, these people came in and uh, they took away everything. And um, then he asked them the question, you know, um, and they killed the son of the representative of uh, the rich man. And he asked them the question, well, you know, what do you think? And they said, well, uh, what do you think the king would do? Well, he will destroy those miserable murderers. <laughs> and then they realized, oh, okay, we the murderers, you know, yes. that story is about us. Um, but of course, they responded with um, antagonism, with reproach, you know, the scribe and the Pharisees, even though when they could see clearly that they were wrong, whereas David did not respond that way. And that's where, again, you see that um, the Spirit of God was working with, with David. Uh, David recognized, wow, you know, I have done this terrible sin. And, and with the story of Joseph, Joseph said, how can I do this wicked thing against God and sin against God? So, so, so here he has sinned against God because as the king, he should have known better. And already, you know, he was established. Um, Ellen White said, God would have done so much more for David had he asked. You know, he had already done so much more for them. But now he takes Uriah's beautiful wife and then murders the man. Uh, so imagine what's going to happen in heaven. Um, because I believe Uriah will be there. He was yes. a righteous man. Um, and you can imagine, you know, David will have to go and explain to Uriah, you know, I'm sorry, brother. You know, but um, that's the thousand years. But besides that, um, we, we see then this was a nice way of letting the king know um, that God loves you. And when you think about um, the lamb, uh, you think about a sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and David saw, wow, okay. Uh, and at the end of his Psalm 51, as we'll look at, he says, uh, um, the sacrifice of God is a contrite heart mm -hmm. and, uh, 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 you know, a clean spirit. So, so he understood here, yeah, wow, you know what? I have done wrong. I have sinned against Bathsheba. I'm a murderer. Uh, and I lied in the process. And um, I love the fact that uh, immediately David confessed. And, and surely he would have had to uh, respond to the plea of the Holy Spirit. He could have, you know, made an excuse. He could have said this and that and come up with his own story as the king. But he realized that he was guilty. And uh, God had, had um, sent Nathan to warn him about this situation. That's, I, I appreciate what you've just shared. I, I like that part of David, that he took responsibility immediately. And, you know, that's mm. the same difference between Peter and Judas, why Judas is lost and why Peter is, will be saved. Both of them did wrong against right. Christ. Both of them, what they did was wrong. Both of them, what they did was worthy of being lost forever. But the one took responsibility immediately when he saw the face of Jesus turning towards him. The other one right. went and hanged himself and regretted mm -hmm. because of, you know, selfish reasons. And this is the same thing with David. David saw the love of God within the story of the parable that Nathan was giving. 
He saw that the very act that he has committed and was probably convicted by, as you said, the Holy Spirit, is probably convicting him all the time that what you have done is wrong, but yet he hasn't taken responsibility for it yet. He's still, um, you know, moving on and almost like pushing aside the guilt. And we, we, we do that too, don't we? We yes, want to push yes. aside the guilt instead of responding to it and actually making a change. And, you know, David's words when he says in Psalm 51 verse 4, I have sinned against the Lord. Mm. You know, as the lesson says, he could have said, I've sinned against Bathsheba. I've sinned against Uriah. But he says, I've sinned against the Lord, which implies you have sinned against mm. Bathsheba. You have sinned against Uriah. And this is what God wants from us. My mm. friends, if, if you are in a situation today that you have done something that you know that you have sinned against God, go to God and give it to him. God still has got a plan for your life in spite mm of what has happened yet they david had to face the consequences there were consequences and this is Absolutely. what tuesday is is about you know he is but before you go on to tuesday yes. there um i just like how god is so quick to pardon yes. because as soon as he said i have sinned i mean uh we don't have all the background story behind that nathan's response immediately was god has taken away your sin Yes. Uh, isn't that wonderful that, that God is there to forgive us, even though he sees that we put ourselves in position. We actually are to blame for that. And um, we actually premeditated, you know, for David to have done all he did in the course of time, you know, the number of days that he took to try and first deceive Uriah and then send him there with his death warrant. And then for the story to come back to him and Joab tells him, listen, tell the king that Uriah the Hittite, you know, is, is dead. I mean, for all that premeditated um, pre murder and deception, I mean, God was aware of all of that. And yet as soon as David said, I have sinned and was willing to confess that sin, immediately Nathan, before he even walks out mm -hmm. from the king, he says, God has taken away your sin. I just love that about God. That is, that is so amazing. And it ties in with Tuesday where um, Nathan said, the Lord has put away your sin. Second Samuel 12 is 13. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> if we think of how we treat people when, and I've, I've experienced this before that, you know, you hurt someone, you've done something that someone has thinks you have offended them, etc. You sincerely apologize but yet they will only accept your apology once they see your behavior is now different. Mm. And God, does, God doesn't work that way. God forgave. Try, knowing that true sorrow for sin leads to a transformation in any case. Amen. You don't need the evidence immediately in the moment. And that's so important for us all, all of us to understand. If someone sincerely apologizes for what they have done, accept that apology. That's why Jesus said, you know, 70 times seven. That's how we need to forgive. We need to have the same heart that God had towards David. David still had plenty of life left in his life to show whether he would do something like this again or not. But that wasn't for God the factor here. It was that yeah. he sincerely repented and he was forgiven. But they, there were consequences still. That's right. You know, if you do something wrong, you ask for forgiveness. If it's something major like this, etc., there are always consequences. And here we see that David loses his child with Bathsheba, the first one. But it's not long after that, after he, he prays, you know, especially Psalm 51, and he prays to God. And then the Bible says he to, it's not maybe after Psalm 51, but it's part of the whole story. <clears throat> Once he got up, knowing that the child is dead, he then goes into his wife and she's pregnant again. And the Bible says, God loved Solomon. <laughs> what a God mm -hmm. do we serve. Mm -hmm. what, how would we have treated David? The, Brian, I mean, if we're honest with ourselves, if, we, if that was a head elder doing it or an elder, how would we have treated David knowing that he's still with the woman that he took unlawfully? There's another child and we say, oh, this poor child, you know, if they only know what his father did, etc. And God says, no, I love Solomon. Man, I think it's a rebuke <laughs> when we look yeah. at God's forgiveness and man's forgiveness. Brian, tells us, tell us more about God's forgiveness in the story here. I, I think this is one of the most beautiful... I mean, uh, we, we sometimes think, well, why, why does God allow all the sordid stuff to be written about uh, David? But I think it's one of the most uh, beautiful passages of Scripture, uh, Psalm 51, because it's the penitentiary psalm. 
the sum of sorrow that David had for his sin, and also the song of God's forgiveness, because he's pleading to God, and of course, God remembers his servant, and that's why he writes with such confidence, you know, take not away from me your Holy Spirit. Um, David's pleading for uh, forgiveness, not just forgiveness, but for cleansing. He, he wants power to overcome. Mm. He, you know, sometimes... You know, um, like, like, like Pharaoh, Pharaoh was sorry that, you know, God was punishing him and he just, he didn't want the punishment, but he was not willing to uh, accept God as God. And so every time, every plague was withdrawn, he went back to his same old self and, and defiance. Uh, so here David is showing that, um, you know, uh, as Paul says in the book of Romans, that don't you know it's the goodness of God that leads thee to repentance? Uh, so the goodness of God led David to realize that, I mean, God tried to do it with Saul, but Saul made excuses. He said, the people, they the ones that, you know, uh, yes. told me. Um, uh, but David took responsibility, said, I've sinned, and then he's pleading for God to forgive him. Of course, what he had done was terrible. Uh, I can imagine that, um, you know, Bathsheba was still newly married. Mm -hmm. They were a young couple. Um, there's no record of her having any children from Uriah. Um, I can imagine Uriah, I mean, he's a stranger that has been accepted into Israel and he's a dedicated soldier for the king. He's on the battlefront for the king. And so uh, he first of all commits adultery with his wife and then tries to deceive him and then kills him. I mean, he's ruined her marriage. He's ruined her life. And um, yeah, David realizes, you know what? Uh, it's only by the grace of God that I can be restored. Uh, and you can imagine the rumors that were rife. I mean, the, the people who had went to fetch and bring her to him, you know, all the whispering in the palace. Did you see who's here with the king? Mm. And then later on, you know, she's pregnant. Uh, oh, okay. This guy came here, tried to make him drunk. All these stories would have gone out. Um, so, so, so we as God's children, we ought to reach out to each other. You know, there's a difference between, you know, open, rebellious, presumptuous sin where someone is continuing it and then they get mm. caught and then, you know, then they sorry. Um, yeah. David, of course, he's found out, but you could see he's got a heart change. And so he's plea to God and that's, and that's our memory text. And that should be our plea as sinners creating me a clean heart of God and renew a steadfast or right spirit. The King James says in me, a steadfast spirit in me. So, so David did not want to be separated from God. Uh, he had hope in God because he knew that with God, there is mercy. He had made mistakes before. This was not the first time he had made mistakes. And uh, we make mistakes time and time again. And do we treat each other as we ought to? God treats us as we are forgiven and the sin is forgotten. Oftentimes with us, hmm, that sin is held there all the time. We are reminded of our sins. And so may we learn from these stories that um, God wants us to be like David, to repent. And God wants us also to forgive others when we have that situation in our lives. Amen. What I like about Psalm 51 is verse 10 and 11. And this is part of Wednesday's part of the lesson. Yes. Psalm 51. Let me just get there. I hope you guys read your Psalm 51, everyone, all the viewers. 10, 11 says, Create to me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast mm. me away mm. from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Yeah. One thing that I've seen wow. in, in my life with God is that when I realize for some reason or whatever it's been that I don't feel his presence or experience, maybe feel is not the right word because it's not a feeling, but I don't experience his presence and his right. hand in my life for whatever reason it is. And I don't like, and once again, we use the word feeling because I don't know how else to explain it. I don't like that feeling. I don't like mm. being in a place knowing that, sure, I'm actually in a place where God is not with me for whatever reason it is. I made the wrong choice or etc. 
I want him with me. And this is what David realized. You know, the sin was clouding his mind. The sin was covering up the fact that he was not connected with God anymore. And once he asked for forgiveness, God could open his eyes and see and say to him, you see, I'm not with you or you're not with me rather. Yeah. And when David realized that, that's when he prays, Lord, do not cast me away from your presence. What mm -hmm. an important thing for us all to understand, never to be without the presence of God. Now, Brian, Adam and Eve, they did the opposite when they realized they sinned. They did not say, Lord, forgive me for my sins. They went mm -hmm. and hid themselves. How do we understand these two if we could were to compare these two stories, how do we, how are we to understand this, Brian? So I'm sure in here, you know, David understanding, you know, the gravity of his sin, uh, knowing the story of Adam and Eve, uh, understanding what happened in the life of uh, people before him, because, you know, the word of God was available for them. And um, though it was really the writings of Moses, uh, Yet there was enough light that God had shed upon David as to understand that, listen, you know what? I have been with you when you faced the lion and the bear. I've, I was with you when you faced Goliath. And um, here you are in a situation where you have placed yourself in harm's way. Hmm. And in fact, he had done that before, uh, Renier, uh, with the issue with Ziegler, you know, when he had banded with the Philistines in the time of Saul. Yes. Uh, when he was running away from Saul, instead of trusting in God to deliver him, which God did, he took matters into his hand and went to find shelter and security with the Philistines, the arch rivals and enemies of Israel. And, um, you know, the town was, was burned down. He, he put himself in a situation where the, the lords were unhappy with him. I mean, they could have, you know, really taken them out. But um, David realized again that uh, God is a God of second chances. Mm -hmm. And if we will place our lives in the hand of God, and later on when he sinned against the numbering of Israel again, uh, God gave him a choice. You know, do, do you want me to allow your enemies to come, you know, give judgments against you? Or, you know, do you want uh, to, you know, for me to take care of the situation? He said, no, I'd rather fall into the hands of God because God is a merciful God. So, so here he recognized that, listen, I've placed myself in this situation because he said, I have sinned. Um, he had nobody else to blame but himself. And so he trusts in the mercy and merits of God. And so uh, the fact that he now places his hope in God, uh, he realizes that his only salvation will come from God. And of course, God comes through for him. And God comes through for us every time that we sin. Now, now let's not take this as, as an excuse to, to go and do a grievous sin and say, Yes, God may forgive you, but remember there are consequences. The child was lost. Bathsheba, uh, of course, was uh, sinned against in the fact that, you know, um, a murder was uh, taken place. Uriah, was, but, but there, there was a, um, a, an alter, not an ultimatum, a judgment that God said to him, to the prophet Nathan, the sword will never depart from you, David. So mm -hmm. David's life from there onwards was one of war. Uh, and yes, God was with him through all that, but who wants to be in war all the time? Mm. Who wants to be welding the sword all the time? And um, as a result of that, he could not build the temple that he wanted to build for God, the sanctuary. Um, because of this background of his, all this bearing the sword and the bloodshed. And God said, okay, no, I'll have to give this to your son, Solomon. So, so, so there were consequences but uh, he trusts in, in, in the heart of God. And um, I'm sure, uh, you know, the, the promise came through for him. I will create a new heart in you. I know that's mm -hmm. the promise that he killed 36, 26. But, but God did that for David. And so he, he writes that uh, for us to recognize that we can have that same forgiveness, that same renewal with God, that same restoration and, and let's never, ever be presumptuous. Let's always recognize that God loves us no matter where we are. It even led to his own household, you know, having problems That's for right. the rest of his life. Uh -huh. I mean, yeah, both Adonai, Adonai and Absalom gave him problems. Mm -hmm. 
his sons. Right. And it's just like, you know, and then he didn't discipline his sons because of what they did and because of what he did. So right. the sin was always plaguing him as in there were consequences. So mm -hmm. as you say, don't go and do something now thinking that God is going to forgive you, which he will, but there yes. will be consequences for your actions. Right. You know, it's, it's, I've seen so many people being arrested after all the looting. Um, even prominent businessmen, CEOs of companies in Durban, or at least one CEO, was arrested because they got him with his Jeep Wrangler, new Jeep, and at the back were a washing machine, or I think a tumble dryer washing machine and some other things. And, you know, there are consequences. Many of the people thought they're going to get away with what they've done, and many have, but many have been caught. And in prison. So there are consequences when we do wrong. Mm. Thursday's part is reflectors of God's light. You know, Psalm 51, 13 and 15. Let's read that as we bring our lesson to a close. Psalm 51, 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners shall be converted to you. Verse 15, O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth shall show forth your praise. Mm, I mean, as the Holy Spirit's working on David's heart, he actually sees that this experience, this forgiveness that he has received and this new heart that can take place or that the cleansing of his heart in his own life will ultimately lead to him being able to reach others, to be mm. a light for those on the outside. And this is what we always need to look at our experience at. Whatever happens in our life is to look from the perspective as to how can I reach people more through what has happened? How can I be a witness to my family, my friends, my colleagues, wherever I find myself, my church? Because of what has happened, as bitter and as terrible it has been, whether it was my fault or not, David was his fault, Job, it wasn't his fault. But yet both could be a light to those mm. around him because of what has happened. And God is calling us to be this light. And right. Brian, Psalm 51 and 1 John 1 verse 9 sounds very, very familiar. The yes. one is a summary of a whole psalm. Uh, what did you get from that part, the relationship between Psalm 51 and 1 John 1 verse 9? You know, Renier, you know, uh, it's, it's a text that I, I quote often when I pray because uh, I know that I'm a sinner. And, mm. and when I have wronged God, or wrong someone else, um, the Holy Spirit convicts me. And um, this is the prayer that I pray, Lord, please forgive me, but don't forgive me, but cleanse me as well. Yes. Don't just forgive my sins because I don't want to go off a forgiven sinner and then be praying the same prayer later on for the same sin, Lord, forgive me. I want to find cleansing. And uh, when you think about when, when David said, you know, cleanse me from my sin, uh, the, the imagery that would have come to his mind is the picture in the sanctuary where the priest would take a, a hyssop and, and spray it there uh, and, 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 and sprinkle the blood. Um, you know, without the shedding of blood, there'll be no forgiveness of sin, the book of Hebrews says. David understood this here, that there would be a price paid for his sin. No doubt the Holy Spirit would have uh, impressed upon his mind. David understood that the Messiah would come through his seed. He understood the covenant promises of God and he recognized, and that's why uh, if you read there in the writing of Ellen White, it says he went after uh, the, the, the issue when the, the child died uh, that was conceived in sin from Bathsheba. God told him the child would die. Uh, he pleaded and fasted because he, 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 he trusted still in the mercy of God. Sometimes the, the promise of God are conditional where, you know, if we are repentant, he will withdraw. Like, for example, the city of Nineveh, when Jonah was sent to preach there, tell them, listen, the city is going to be destroyed. Of course, he preached and they repented. And of course, God did not destroy the city. So I guess David here is like, wow, okay, God is a merciful God. So I'm going to pray, I'm going to fast. But when he realized that, you know, the child had died, the Bible says he got up and Ellen White commenting on that in Patriots and Prophets says, after he had bathed and had something to eat, he went and worshipped. Mm. He went to the temple to worship. And, and of course, the imagery of the hyssop is that the blood washes away our sins. But of course, clearly the Bible says that if we continue with that sin, then uh, 
the, the, the thing that we are doing is we are wounding afresh or crucifying afresh Jesus Christ. Yeah. Because God wants to forgive you and me. Uh, but if we go back to sin, what have we done? We have actually made a mockery of the death of God. And so David cries out for forgiveness. And so John says, um, Con, if I confess my sins to him, he is faithful. God is always faithful. And just, God is righteous. And that's what David was saying in the Psalm 31. Thou alone are altogether righteous. He's pleading his case to the righteous God. So God is faithful. God is just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And then it says, from all our sin and unrighteousness. So, mm-hmm. so God is in the business of renewing us. Not just forgiving us, but to uh, restore us into his image. And, and this is what God wants for you and I today that we might have a renewed heart, a new heart, filled with his Holy Spirit, overpower, I mean, with power to overcome sin. And then, of course, when he comes, we'll be ready to go home with him. Amen. Thank you for that great ending to the lesson, Brian. If you need forgiveness, God's willing to forgive. If you need to be cleansed, God's willing to cleanse. Christ Mm -hmm. has done it all so that he can do all in you and me. May God bless you until we meet again next time when we study the lesson. Let's pray together as we end off. Father in heaven, thank you so much for all your blessings. Thank you for your forgiveness, that you're willing to cleanse and to make us new and renew us. Father, Mm -hmm. I pray that you would be with each viewer that is wrestling with you at this moment with what is happening in their life and in their hearts. I pray that they would make that surrender to you so that you can complete the work in them and in me and in Brian that you have started. Pray now that you'll be with us for the rest of this week until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.